hand for the family. gathered for the memorial service for Sister Sarah Walton. She passed away on December 21st, 2022, which was the darkest day of the year and the brightest day of her life. Shall we pray together? Father, we thank you for the life that Sarah lived. We thank you for the legacy of her children and grandchildren who know you. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel that she embraced at a young age. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel that she lived and the gospel hope with which she died. And we thank you for the assurance that we have through your word that those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will be reunited with her one day in glory. And so we ask that your son might be glorified to this service. We pray it for Christ's sake. Amen. Welcome to all of you who are here. I want to begin by just considering a quick thought about Job. The darkest moment of Job's life, at the moment of his greatest pain. Job cried out in worship to the Lord and said, the Lord gives, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a thought that God's people alone truly understand. That in the midst of our greatest pain, we can say, blessed be the name of of the Lord. That's a, that's a confidence, that's a joy that doesn't come from our circumstances, and it doesn't come from this world. It comes from one place only, and that is through Jesus Christ our Lord. From the hand of a gracious and good God who has everything in control and who cares deeply for his people. And the first song that we're going to sing today captures that idea. There's a particular phrase in there specifically regarding the occasion of a funeral that says, for Christ, your gift from heaven, from death has set us free. And we through him are given the final victory. When we come to an occasion like this, God's people, we grieve, but we rejoice because we have a Savior who has given us the final victory. In, our, in, in your bulletins, you have a handout for the first song that we're going to sing. Oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today. Would you stand with me and sing?
Robinson, a friend of the family, and uh, on behalf of my wife and, and I, um, this is a special occasion. It's always a special occasion when you speak to friends. Most of us have acquaintances by the dozens. Friends are special, and it's my privilege to look at friends today. Lee, God knew what he was doing when he made Sarah and gave her to you. Now, in all honesty, I think it was a little bit above your pay grade, <laughs> but, uh, but he, he did good. And in doing good for you, he did good for 21, count them, uh, grandchildren and children. Friendship meets needs and, and provides means of service. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of stressing on the word friends because I'm not sure we all know what, a friend, what friendship is. It's giving. It's serving. It's putting someone else above your own wants or desires. It's understanding that God has put somebody in your life that uh, maybe you didn't plan on. We met here at church uh, years ago and became uh, attached to uh, Lee and Sarah, and um, how did she help you out? Well, after my wife passed away, I, I would want to go to a particular um, service or a program or something, and, and uh, I would ask, well, what can I bring? Sarah would have said, you don't bring anything. I've made enough for everybody. And uh, so I don't think I ever had to make anything, so God is good <laughs> in that. One of the ble great blessings of life is friendship. Um, we met here, I was, I was looking at ideas of what brings you together. Conversation brings you together. Similarities bring you together, which points up maybe differences can bring you together. Um, Lee, I still haven't gotten used to this hook em horns thing, but um, he taught me about that. and. Uh, he also taught me that um, he was an engineer, and my whole experience with that word is learning to spell it. Because uh, I had nothing, I, I have no engineering or, or talent that way. But God brought us together, and we've had a lot of fun together. We've had some sad times together, but we've had it together. And that's the essence of friendship. Uh, I told you about the food. She brought food for us and for everyone else. Trust is involved. And also, I want to add to trust, travel. Uh, I think you can travel with one person or, or travel once with someone or a group, and that's fine. You can get along, hopefully. But if you're going to travel over and over, you're either going to become friends with them or you're, you're just playing a game. And we traveled many places together. 
And if anything happened to the car, he was able to fix it. Uh, I, would, I would say repair, but she was from Mississippi and I'm from Georgia, so we say fix. And, uh, and he was able to do that. Really a talented person in things like that. We talked about uh, investment, and I told him um, where to leave it uh, when he finished. And uh, so he took care of, of, of many things with me like that. He was interested in what I wanted to do and where I would go. And these people endear themselves to you through a servant's heart, and that is serving. And so actually both of them, I spoke to my wife and to me considerably, and we enjoyed being with them. I want to mention that Sarah was a, a doer. If you needed something done, she would do it. A lot of people talk about things, and Sarah, while you were talking about it, she took care of it. And that was such a blessing to not only her family, but to families around her. And she did that here at church and among other situations. Um, faithful in service. And I wanted, I'll close with a comment to um, the children and grandchildren. I don't think that you are yet out from under the prayers of your mother and grandmother. I think God knows those prayers, heard those prayers, and he knows. I don't think God always answers the time we want him to answer, but he answers. And you want his will done, and that includes today. To God be the glory for things like that. He must be, but God's good. So I would tell your children and grandchildren to remember that your mother and grandmother prayed for you, and those prayers were meaningful. She would wish that you would join her in heaven and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Just in case, thank you all for coming. Thanks for showing your support and love for our family, as well as your love for our Mimi. Proverbs 31, 28 through 31, describes the virtuous woman. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also when he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. As grandkids, we'd like to share with you our thoughts and memories of Mimi, but rather than just reading each one of those, um, those memories, we've compiled them into a final thank you letter to Mimi from the grandkids. I know she's in heaven, and I don't know how it all works theologically speaking, but I like to think that she's watching, or at the least, God will pass on our message to her. Dear Mimi, we love you and we miss you. Thank you for the example you set far before we ever knew you, for taking a chance on the old guy who came back to Bob Jones to get a wife, <laughs> for your patience and support as you moved across the country from the oasis of California to the uh, non-oasis of New Jersey, and ultimately to Florida, then to South Carolina. Mimi, thank you for your love, kindness, and strength as you and Pop raised a family of six kids while dealing with sports practices, music lessons, cockroaches, and cloth diapers. <laughs> we see that same love, patience, kindness, and strength exemplified in our parents, which we one day hope to model for our own families. Thank you, Mimi, for your prayers and the thousand little ways you loved and supported us through the years. You always remembered our birthdays, and you and Pop showed up to countless musical, sporting, and other random events. You were very devoted to serving your family and made many, many sacrifices to spend time with us. We remember how you used the little moments to point us to God and how to grow in our walk with Him. Morgan mentioned how you would have her over to the house and easily and teach her how to clean. She still remembers that day when you sat down with her at the kitchen table and taught her from God's Word. 
She's never forgotten how you wanted each one of us to know God and that you loved your grandkids dearly and prayed for us regularly. Thank you for opening up your home and your kitchen to us. We have many fond memories of Cousins Camp, sleepovers with you and Pop. We will miss the breakfast you prepared and the times that we would sit around the table and talk with you. John and Harris will also miss your pancakes with sprinkles. And Levi will especially miss your eggs and bacon, which he says were second to none. I also recall how you brought or how you bought groceries so that I could have a snack or meal whenever I was hungry after coaching at a nearby park. Even after your stroke, you always put on a smile and tried to laugh no matter how bad of a day you were having. As soon as we would walk in the door to your room, you were so happy to see us. I personally remember being caught off guard when I visited you in the hospital. When I stepped through the door, you chucked that lacrosse ball at me and laughed at my surprised reaction. Then you quickly asked for the ball back as you waited for your next unsuspecting victim. I think you had to have that sense of humor, whether you wanted to or not, after being married to Pop for so many years. He would often try to make you or the family laugh, and he succeeded on most occasions, though I do remember a time or two where you would let him know, or try to let him know, he had crossed the line, either with a look or by saying, Lee, with a disapproving shake of the head. These are but a few of the endless stories, memories, and lessons we'd like to thank you for. Though we may try, we can never thank you enough, nor remember every kind word or deed. This letter is far too short to recount most of those things, nor does it come close to encompassing all that you mean to us. I've summarized a lot of the grand, uh, grandkids' thoughts and try to capture the essence of how we will remember you. But in closing, I want to quote two of my cousins who Mimi, I think, can speak for all of us. First, Mimi, you were not only the grandma that any grandchild wanted, but also the grandma that every grandchild needed. From giving the warmest of hugs to showing up at just about every award ceremony, piano recital, soccer game, you never failed to provide each one of us the love, patience, and support that we also dearly needed. You are someone we look up to, someone we love, and most of all, you are a Christ-like example that all of your grandkids will try to model. Thank you, Mimi, for being the best grandma a kid could have ever asked for. We love you and we miss you. Love the grandkids. Thank you, Al, and thank you, Ryan. Um, fun, fun memories, great memories. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Walton. I'm uh, number five of six children, number two of two boys. And uh, my wife and I and our family are from Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, sometimes we have been referred to as the black sheep of the family. We've uh, on just about every time we're here, we are asked, when are you going to move over here? But we're, we're um, holding strong in Tennessee, but we're glad to, glad to be here. I, I want to, um, first of all, thank everybody else for being here as well and to celebrate the life of my mom. And thank you for those that have traveled. For um, I, I just got to get this out of the way, so it, it's going to get better here in a second. <laughs> But thank you, those that have traveled from far away. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us. You all have been a, a very special part of my mom and dad's life, just out here in the lobby, hearing how you know them and um, what they've meant to you. And we're so grateful that you're here with us this afternoon. So um, the last four and a half months of, of my mom's life here on earth were not easy, um, but in a unique way, it was a gift to have some extra time for her kids. to take care of the one who always took care of everyone else. I'm so grateful to my sisters and my brother who did much of the toiling and the hard work these last months. I know 100% that they wouldn't trade it for anything. And I didn't have the privilege of being here all those moments, but the times that I was here the last few months, I did get some special time to, to hug her and to love on her, and, and, it, and God has been so good to us in this process. Uh, it was a gift from God to get to spend some, some, some of that time with, with our family and just to hear, hear things. And um, I heard quite a few news stories uh, that Pop hadn't shared with me 
um, in my 48 years of life, but um, I'll get to that in a second. One, one memory Ryan mentioned about Mimi throwing the ball, when I brought my two youngest over here after her, her uh, first stroke, um, I said, Ben, Sam, she's, she's had a stroke and she's in really bad shape. And so when we go in there, let's be quiet and let's just kind of be with her and let her know that you're there. And, and as soon as they walked in, her face lit up and um, she had the squishy therapy ball or whatever and with her left hand because her right hand was not working anymore. And she threw it to Sam and, and, and then, to Ryan's point, kind of waited for him to throw it back. And once again, that's how she was. She was always wanting else, everybody else to feel comfortable, feel at ease, even though at that time she wasn't feeling too great. Um, and, you know, as we, as we spent these, these last moments together, Pop did pull out some new stories. And um, as he reminisced about his life with mom and he reflected on how things between him and, and my mom came to be, the recurring theme that I heard from my dad was how undeserving he was to have such a, a, a wife and how good God was to my dad by giving him the best wife, the best mother, the best Mimi, uh, and the best friend that he could ever ask for. In fact, dad went on to say that he knew when he met her that she was gonna be wonderful and special, but never, never could have expected all that he would get when he decided to marry mom. That's the wonderful thing about God's will in our life. We imagine all the things we need and want, but God has a much better plan for us uh, if we let him. I know my dad was glad to let God do the leading in finding a wife. And he did a good job, a better job than, than dad could have done. So, <laughs> Dad told me the story about when he was dating mom and got invited to come home and meet her family in Greenville, Mississippi. Uh, this is during a college Christmas break. And after a wonderful visit um, and time for him to head home to Austin, Texas, there came a big snowstorm that didn't allow my dad to cross the, the bridge there to cross the Mississippi River to get home back to Texas. Now, I have a feeling that if my dad was with anybody else, he would have figured out a way to get home to Texas. But according to dad, he had no choice uh, but, but to stay longer with mom's family in Mississippi. No doubt this was a, a God-ordained snowstorm and was one more way that God directed my dad to his perfect mate. I also heard another funny story um, that I'd never heard um, when when Dad came to Bob Jones to, to find a, a wife, I think that's why you were there, um, my mom, um, he had asked my mom on, on, I guess it was one of the first dates to a fine arts event there at the school. And as you all have seen, uh, especially when my dad's standing next to Todd and I, you, you see that he, he's slightly vertically challenged maybe, or, or maybe, maybe slightly below average, we'll call it that. Um, and we, we often get questions about how this five foot eight is it five foot eight? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. How how this five foot eight uh, man was able to produce two boys that were over six foot tall. Um, anyhow, mom had a, a college friend or roommate that was there, and um, she was going to give uh, the sign to to mom when when she walked in with dad to see if he was tall enough to be qualified for mom. So mom must have had a list of qualifications, and probably number one on the list was that that man had to be at least taller than she was. So when mom looked over to her friend, her friend said. Yeah, he, ju he just made it. So um, that, that was the first time I'd heard that story. But another way that God had helped my dad to find his perfect mate. He might have been wearing some good shoes that night, too. I don't know. <laughs> so, so those were a couple of the lighter side stories I've heard over these last months. But I also heard other stories. And as I heard these stories, it continued to match up with what I knew and experienced as one of her children. And that was mom was the most unselfish person I've ever known. Her life was one of quiet, quiet service to the Lord and to others. And when I think of the two greatest commandments that Jesus gave his followers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and then to love your neighbor as yourself, mom lived those commandments out in her life daily. She set the ultimate example for us to follow as parents. My wife shared with me how important my mom was in her life. The love that my mom provided Christy had a huge impact in her life as a wife and young mother. In the 30 years that Christy knew my mom, she always felt like she treated her as one of her own with her tender, loving, and sweet spirit, always being available to her at any time. This has played a big role in our marriage and family life. When we needed guidance or counsel, we could always go to Mimi. And she was always available. Ryan, I should have pulled this out earlier, sorry. 
Dad told me the story about all the places they lived earlier in their marriage. And they started out in Ohio. I may, I may have this not exactly right, but then moved down to Austin, Texas, um, where uh, they had Karen, our first child, and then moved to Dallas, where Shelly was born, then moved out to California, where their small family was able to bond with our California cousins, the Dixons, who are representing here today. Thank you for being here. And then to New Jersey on a work assignment where Todd was born. And then down to Florida where Carice was born. And then back up to Massachusetts on another work assignment where I was born. And back to Florida where they settled to raise a family and they decided that they could finish on a better child than me. And, and then Stephanie was born. And finally they made it up here to South Carolina where they spent the last 20 plus years. As you may have already heard today, uh, January 2nd, today would have been 58 years of marriage. January 2nd, 1965, was the day that God made a perfect union between my mom and dad. 58 years of marriage, six children, and 21 grandchildren. God is good, God is good. This may come to a shock to many of you, but I wasn't the perfect child. And uh, some of my self-induced bad memories I had growing up are now wonderful memories and lessons. And as I understand, Todd may have shared some similar memories here. There were some nights that I came home in the wee hours and remind you that this is before the day of cell, cell phones, no Life360, she wasn't tracking my location. Um, but as I walked quietly to the front door, I was greeted by my mother. We had a, a, a little cedar bench that sat out in our front porch area, and when the weather was good, she'd usually be waiting out there, or if not, inside on the couch with a little lamp on. And I have vivid memories of my mom with her Bible, and no doubt, talking with the Lord, waiting there for me. She never screamed at me, or even used those moments to preach at me, but she made it known that she disapproved, but it was always in love, and even in those situations, I saw her sacrificing as she let Pop sleep and get his eight hours of rest. Um, and I was thankful for that too. Uh, <laughs> but the, the Lord worked in, in my life in those moments. And it was that tender, loving um, direction. And I knew my mom had a relationship with the Lord like no other, and uh, that helped all of us. Now I'd like to share a couple other things that um, uh, the uh, other siblings have shared. When thinking of mom, I would say the word selfless most encompasses her, her character. Mom truly cared about others, especially her family. It was only with God's strength she was able to stretch her time and love between her husband and six children. Mom always had a listening ear and she always sensed when I was doing wrong or doing, going through a hard time. She always took the time to show love and wisdom to deal with our occasional unwise life choices. I know her years of being on her knees has protected our paths through life. I'll amen that. With six children, there also came the necessity of frugality in our growing up years. As mom and dad chose Christian education for their children, things stayed a little tight. And I, I'll amen that too. I remember drinking powdered milk a time or two. <laughs> mom never complained and always found a way to stretch a dollar. We always had our needs met. She prioritized eating together as a family and I have many fond memories of our home-cooked family meals, even though I dreamed of eating those cool TV dinners. Even though mom worked hard at managing her home and family, she would still make time for others. She's invested e eternally into many friends and family throughout her life, and I know when she got to heaven, she heard, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I remember my mom always ready to listen to me. Anytime I would share worries, disappointments, or sad feelings, she would direct me to pray and try to change my thinking. She would encourage me to think outside of myself and find ways to serve others. She focused so much on service and was a great example to me. I pray that I will follow her advice for the rest of my life. I'm so thankful for the wonderful words, uh, the wonderful mother she was to me. From as early as I can remember, she was so sacrificial. She worked hard with raising her children and tirelessly with working at Skycrest all day. That was the school she worked at growing up. Coming home and cooking dinner every night and making it to all of our extracurricular activities. I truly don't know how she did it. She showed us Christ in her everyday life and our need for him daily. I remember her reading her Bible daily, very early in the morning in the living room. She always put her relationship with the Lord as a priority. 
I could tell my mom anything through my teenage and high school years. She was always there to listen and to give advice. She was so steady through raising all of her children. I have cherished the years she has had with her grandchildren to leave her mark on them. There are so many times she sacrificed herself for our well-being. She was so selfless with her time, she would help anyone who needed it before herself. We had so many sincere conversations over these past few months. What a gift God gave us in giving her four and a half more months to care for her in every way. She was so ready to meet her Savior, which she verbalized often. She often wondered why she was still here with us towards the end. We know she was a light to all that met her, even until the very end. We trust the Lord with his perfect timing in her death. And one, one specific um, story or occurrence that, that I wanted to mention on behalf of Todd. Todd and, and, and Wanda, um, and I look at uh, little, Dave, little, little David that's not so little anymore. Uh, we waited a long time for David. And um, when, when Wanda was um, pregnant with David, um, she, she was pretty much had to stay in bed most of that pregnancy. And, and um, Mimi was there by their side, there, um, I don't know if daily, but very often to help with, with things because we all wanted to see baby David um, come. And, and uh, we, we also got a, a David, a Daniel, and a, and a Matthew after that. But um, Todd and Wanda were especially appreciative of, of, of her sacrificial love there. Also, um, we, we had some Facebook comments that we received over the last week or so that, that we just wanted to read here. Uh, from people that that mom has uh, impacted or influenced in her life. Such great memories of visiting your house as a kid. She was always so welcoming. No words will ever be adequate. She was amazing and leaves an unmatched legacy. The entire Walton family is precious, and anyone who knew your mom knows she's the quiet yet bold backbone for this amazing family. I am super, super grateful for having known her, and she no doubt gets a front row seat in the church pew in heaven. Generational blessings inherited and passed on. She guided and sacrificed for, for both of us as children and young adults, leading us in a relationship with our Lord. Her kindness and hospitality are something I will never forget about her, making all of us feel so welcome in your home back in college days. Looking back, I can always remember how welcoming and kind she was. She always found a way to make room at the table. She set an awesome example. I've just learned of her passing. She was such a godly influence and wonderful mentor to so many young moms at Skycrest. I think often of some of the lessons she taught me that have served me well for many years. I miss knowing she is in this world, but rejoice she is with her Savior. She was certainly one of the kindest, gentlest women around. She was such a dear friend, one of my very first friends at Calvary. That was the church down in Clearwater, Florida. She and Lee were the true example of a Christian marriage. They were always true servants for the Lord. I remember how Sarah always had time to help others, to listen and to respond to their needs. I learned a lot by watching Sarah and her quiet leading. What an outstanding Christian woman. She truly was a virtuous woman. Her children rose up and called her blessed. I remember her fondly as a truly sweet and tender woman. What a dear, godly, and gracious woman. Mom was close to the Lord and walked with him daily. When I reflect on her life, I'm reminded of Jesus' Jesus instruction to his disciples in John chapter 13, verses 12 to 15. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, you are right, for so I am. If I, then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Jesus was the perfect example. I can confidently say that my mom consistently tried to follow his example. I don't think there are any formulas or techniques that will guarantee success in a family, but my mom has provided a blueprint that she got right out of the Bible. I believe this leads to a life that will glorify the Lord and in turn allow us to be recipients of God's blessings both here on earth and also eternally in heaven. My mom wasn't perfect, but one thing I can confidently say is that her life is a testament to God and his love. I'm so thankful for the example she left us all. My hope is that I can be to my family and friends just a fraction of what she was. I'd like to finish with a scripture here that reminds me of my mom, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Psalm 16, verses 1 through 2, and verses 5 through 11. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad. I can't even see the words. <laughs> and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 61, verses 1 through 5. Hear my cry, O God. 
Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Psalm 91, verses 1 through 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. This is the word of the Lord. Hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share. As we tarry there, none other has ever known. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling, but he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever Very glad to have my voice back. I had laryngitis all last week, and I was really praying, hoping to get it back so I could be here for this occasion. And I'm thankful to the Lord to be able to be with the family today on this wonderful occasion when we think of the home going of Sister Sarah Walton. On Wednesday evening, our church has been working through the book of Ecclesiastes. And that explains why a passage from the second chapter of Solomon's exploration of the quandaries of life came to mind as I drove away from the Walton's home in Greenville just over a week ago. I had stopped by in to see Lee and also made the acquaintance of two children and also two of their grandchildren. 
Lee showed me a picture taken years earlier of the whole Walton clan. And I had seen that same picture hanging in the Walton's former home back in Easley. It shows a happy, blessed, and a large family. At the center is a Proverbs 31 woman, Sarah Walton, whose influence on so many, as we've heard, is both endearing and enduring. Sarah's kindness, forbearance, and inner joy made her an unusually pleasant person. I first met Sarah eight years ago when the strength that she had to raise six children had long since abandoned her. She was weak. She was tired. Her energy had ebbed away, but joy remained. Sarah had found the kind of contentment that comes only at the conclusion of a worthy life. She had an inner sense of peace that rebukes the empty platitudes and vanities that Solomon pursued in Ecclesiastes. And that's why I think the book came so quickly to mind as I drove away from their house that day. And I want to point you to Ecclesiastes today not as a commentary on Sarah's life, precisely the opposite. In many ways, Ecclesiastes presents the antithesis of Sarah's life. The word Solomon chose to describe his own experience in life was the word vanity. That's a word that means frustration, emptiness. How many people do you know that end life with a profound sense of emptiness? How many gravestones could be inscribed with a single word, vanity? But somehow Sarah avoided the empty life that has characterized millions. No one would describe her as a deeply frustrated person. So why was Solomon so frustrated? And what did Sarah discover that proved so elusive for a wise man like Solomon? To understand Solomon, consider a man whom the Gospels introduce us to. We call him the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus Christ and walked away frustrated. He had hoped that by meticulous observance of the law, he would earn favor with God. And he failed to understand Christ's gospel. Now, that man had a combination of three distinct advantages that very few people in world history enjoy. He had money, time, and power. He was, after all, a rich young ruler. Well, think of Solomon. He, too, was a rich young ruler. And he had money, time, and power to fully pursue the riddles of life. Consequently, Solomon used his advantages to launch an existential quest to find meaning in life. And the book of Ecclesiastes is a confession written years later by a man who was once a rich young ruler. And Solomon looked back over his long life with genuine dismay. And he tells us in chapter 7 and verse 2 that it would be very good for all of us to attend a funeral, the house of mourning, and to let our hearts ponder the end of our own lives. Now listen to how Solomon develops his thought in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Solomon writes of his frustration with worldly pleasures. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, and of pleasure, what use of it? What use is it? Solomon acknowledges that he deliberately sought out pleasure. And Solomon was no ordinary hedonist. Solomon was a scientific hedonist who deliberately experimented with his own heart. He weighed various pleasures to see whether they would satisfy him. And he has money, time, and power at his disposal. 
But like a scientist whose experiments fail, like a failed chemist who blows up his laboratory, Solomon exclaims, it's all madness. Derek Kidder calls Solomon's quest, quote, the paradox of hedonism. The more you hunt for pleasure, the less, you of, it, the less of it you find. So beginning with verse 3, Solomon gives us a further summary of his experiment. I searched my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold on folly till I might see what good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. So Solomon conducts an experiment with alcohol. He knows the danger of excess, the misery of a hangover. His heart guides him on a quest to discover that moment when alcohol liberates us from the tedium of life, filling the heart with laughter, with folly, without pressing the experiment too far. And he keeps a grip on himself. He wants to find the exact quantity that satisfies the children of man. He treats pleasure as a precise quantity of alcohol or a substance to be consumed, and he meets with frustration. So he continues his quest for pleasure. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Well, monarchs of the ancient Near East, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, were famous for constructing great royal houses. And they situated these houses among terraced gardens and great pools of water. Babylon's hanging gardens were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Solomon constructs for himself a veritable Garden of Eden right in the middle of Jerusalem. But the return to paradise can only come through the means that God has ordained. And Solomon has yet to embrace the gospel. And Solomon once again meets with frustration. So he continues, I bought male and female slaves and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Well, Solomon's wealth is attested by the surpassing number of slaves that he owned as well as the great size of his flocks. His wealth surpassed David, who also ruled Jerusalem. And long before David conquered Jerusalem, the Jebusites ruled the city, and Solomon surpassed them all, he says. But these possessions were not enough. He still needed more. The human heart set on anything other than God will never be satisfied. So Solomon continues, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasures of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of man. So again, his wealth is attested by these great quantities of silver, gold, and treasures that he amassed. With his vast wealth, he was able to pursue luxurious entertainments. Israel was strategically situated at the center of a trading route between Egypt and points further east. Flowing through the Ark of Mesopotamia, gold and silver flowed right into his coffers. He was a very wealthy man. And if ever there was a man who had the opportunity to pursue pleasure through unbridled sexual profligacy, it was Solomon. He is history's most famous polygamist. But Solomon's life was still full of frustration. Vanity of vanities. So Solomon acknowledges that even though he already surpassed all that were before him, he went headlong into every additional pleasure that he could find. And he writes, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me, and whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. 
And friends, only a person who has wealth, time, and power could write those words. There are extremely few people in life who have the combination of all three. Wealth, time, and power. Now, I never knew Sarah and her youth, but I'm pretty certain she was never a woman of vast wealth and power. So would you say that she was disadvantaged over Solomon? If life is a race to find satisfaction, wasn't Sarah disadvantaged by starting miles behind Solomon? Well, that's certainly how the world views wealth and power, does it not? Well, what did Solomon achieve ultimately with his vast wealth, time, and power? Did Solomon, did Solomon achieve the kind of life that someone like Sarah could only dream of? Well, Solomon confesses, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Frustration. Utter, debilitating frustration. Solomon was not only frustrated, he was frustrated by his frustrations. But you never had that sense about Sarah Walton. Certainly, she dealt with frustrations in life. She was married to Lee, after all. We all have frustrations. But her whole life was not one big frustration. It was not a life that you would say, well, that was vanity of vanities, frustration of frustration. In fact, hers was a very simple life compared to the extravagant glories of Solomon's life. But her life was anything but frustrating. Now, let's be very careful. Solomon does acknowledge through Ecclesiastes that he finds momentary joys, like those sudden warm moments when we enjoy a beautiful sunset or reconnect with long lost friends or rehearse happy memories or enjoy a new food. Solomon does find momentary joys. However, those momentary joys can actually produce greater frustration when you discover that they don't add up to permanent joy. Permanent joy proved elusive. Joy does not work like a 401k where you just invest a little bit every month and it adds up to a nest egg of joy in the end. Solomon never went off happily into retirement. In fact, there was one enormous frustration that haunted him, unlike all the others. In verse 14 of chapter 2, he notes, And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all people. And what is that event? At the end of verse 16, how the wise dies just like the fool. When Solomon considered his own death, his heart sunk into utter despair. Life is full of frustration, and then you die. That's pretty much Ecclesiastes until you get to the end. But it was that gloomy outlook that led Solomon into a very dark place. And he writes in verses 17 through 19, So I hated life because what is done of the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after when. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, that he will be master for all of which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity." It's clear that pleasure turns very swiftly to hate. Indeed, the border between pleasure and hate is very narrow indeed. The pleasure we pursue swiftly becomes loathsome. Solomon sought pleasure and toil and soon hated toil. 
He sought pleasure in alcohol and soon despised it. He sought pleasure in an illicit relationship and became swiftly frustrated. And Solomon fretted over his successor. Everything he amassed might be left to a fool. And Solomon had good reason to fear. Rehoboam, Solomon's son and successor, was a fool. Now again, all of us who know Sarah, I suspect, would, lead, would see her life as the very opposite of the life that Solomon is here describing. She was a woman who was full of joy. She was a woman who just struck me as very content. She found satisfaction in the simplest things. In her husband, we all know you're never going to meet a nicer, kinder, more lovely couple than Lee and Sarah Walton. She found satisfaction in her children and her many grandchildren and sharing the gospel and serving the church and caring for the needy. She did not need vast wealth or building projects to find joy. Sarah was not the kind of high-maintenance celebrities that we have in our culture, always looking for the next thrill because permanent joy proves elusive. She was a remarkably content woman, and it proved true in the end when she was patient and suffering and remained kind and gracious toward all. And Sarah faced death with dignity. She ended life with joy rather than frustration. She ended life with a rich legacy and a godly heritage to pass down to succeeding generations. And I don't suspect that any of her children are a Rehoboam. I certainly don't suspect it at all. So I want to know, how did she achieve such joy rather than frustration when she was never a rich young ruler? And the answer is really very simple. Sarah discovered early in life what Solomon discovered late in life. Listen to what Solomon says in the final chapter. Not that the rich young ruler has grown old. In the final analysis, Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Sarah embraced the gospel early in life and never forsook it. She confessed Jesus Christ, the Creator, as her Savior as a young girl in a Bible memory camp. So Solomon tells us to remember our God, our Creator. Remember that you were created for God, and you will never find joy apart from your Creator. It's actually impossible. Solomon tells elsewhere in Ecclesiastes that God can give you a world full of good things, but he can withhold the power to enjoy any of them. Nothing in all creation will ever satisfy us independently of the Creator. That is how God designed reality. And that's precisely the point that C.S. Lewis made in his book, his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. We find joy in our Creator. Apart from God, all life is frustration. So remember God and find joy. Now listen to what else Solomon says in conclusion. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. In the Old Testament, the phrase, fear God, is an equivalent to the New Testament emphasis on saving faith. When Abraham proved his faith by offering his own son Isaac, God responded, I know that you fear God. Abraham had faith in God. Job was described as a man who feared God, a man of faith. So fearing God and keeping his commandments is a matter of justification, fearing God, 
and sanctification, keeping his commandments. When we trust God for salvation by embracing the atonement that the Lord Jesus Christ made on the cross, we are justified. To fear God is to embrace God's truth, whatever he has revealed to you. God's truth that we are sinners and God's truth that we can find salvation through the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are sanctified through Christ's resurrection power, then we set about to keep his commandments through the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit. So fear God and keep his commandments. Our duty, our whole duty, Solomon says, is to embrace what the New Testament calls justification by faith alone and begin a lifelong pursuit of sanctification. Trust and obey. That's the gospel. And Sarah embraced that gospel at the beginning of her life as a young girl. Christ's gospel was her source of joy. And friends, she found joy not in wealth, not in time, not in power, she discovered early in life what Solomon discovered late in life. The gospel is the most important thing in life. And that's why the family made a single request of me. And that is that I make the gospel clear. And I hope that I have done that today. This is what Solomon finally discovered. Fear God. Fear your creator, put faith in Christ, and keep his commands. Now, friends, because Sarah embraced the gospel, she was never haunted by Solomon's greatest frustration, death itself. If you've ever had the privilege of standing at the bedside of a Christian when she dies, as Sarah's husband and children did, I'm told, you will learn something very interesting. She dies without frustration, as if she is going to go right on living. Paul is emphatic in Romans. When Jesus died, we died. We died with him. And when Jesus resurrected, we resurrected with him. And what he means is that our resurrection is so certain in Christ that he can speak of it as an already accomplished fact. Sarah was already resurrected as a young girl when she put her faith in Christ. And so for the believer, friends, the sting of death is removed. It is removed by the guarantee of bodily resurrection. And that's why the psalmist can say in Psalm 116 and verse 15, these words, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Over the past little bit, we have heard the testimony of a godly woman and her godly family, what makes them godly and what has given them joy. We have heard the testimony of their great and good God. We have heard why it is that they as believers looking forward to the return of their Savior can say that whether it's peace like a river or sorrows like sea billows. In everything that we face, we can say, it is well with my soul. We can say, Jesus is coming, even so, come quickly. Lord Jesus, would you stand with me and testify of that very thing? It is well, it is well with my soul.
Sarah would want you to say today that it is well with your soul in Jesus Christ. We're going to pray, and then if you would remain standing after so that the family can be dismissed, and then the rest of us will be dismissed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for that wonderful promise that not only has our sin been nailed to the cross of Christ, but he is risen and he is coming again. And so our hope, our hope is alive. We thank you, Father, that Sarah has had the opportunity to realize her hope fully. And for those of us who remain, Father, may we live according to the testimony that she has left behind to continue looking forward to Christ that we may find our joy in him, for it is at his side, in his presence, with you, Father, through him, that we find pleasures and joy forevermore. Thank you for this hope. May we walk in it today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stay standing, family, you can be dismissed.